Where are the heroes? You know, our kids, um, girls and boys, love going to the movies and watching these hero movies. Even my girls love Avengers. They love Thor. They love Iron Man. I never liked any of those movies until Brad influenced my daughters. And because he influenced my daughters, they want to take the whole family to go see all the superheroes. But why do we love them? A lot of times we look at... Um, athletes that are stars and we see them and our kids want to be just like them or movie stars or rock stars and our kids start envying because they want to have a superhero and all along God established a superhero that should be in a child's life and it should be their dad unfortunately today and I want to share some statistics with you that are shocking and mind-blowing with where are the heroes. I'm gonna go through these for you. This is talking about a fatherless society. <clears throat> Did you know that today 24 million children in America do not have their biological father in their home? That means that one out of every three kids you meet, there's not a dad in that home. 85% of children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. Do you notice today how many kids in school we have this exact issue going on? 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers, those are people who are addicted to drugs, they come from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Do you know that I've heard statistics that every six seconds a teenager takes their own life? And yet, today, do we not think we have an epidemic on our hands? 80% of rapists are motivated with displaced anger. They come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in the state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prisons grew up in a fatherless home. 71% of teenage pregnancies are to children of single parents. You know, here's the crazy thing today. We look around and we think, yeah, that's sad. What can we do about it? Well, today we're going to help you to understand what we can all do about it because every one of us can play a part, whether you're male or female. But today we truly have an epidemic in our society, and it's that the father is the missing link. And not just any father because you know what's amazing about these stats? is they say that even though these are for true families who the parent, the dad is not in the home, there's many more homes where there's an invisible father. You say, what's an invisible father? That's a father who physically, his body is there. He may go to work, he may provide the income, but when he comes into that home, he's invisible to the children and to the family. He's not pouring into them. He's not growing them up. He's not doing what God designed him to do, and because of it, He's invisible. I want to tell you about a guy. I read a story just this week about a guy who grew up with an invisible dad. He said, as a little kid, I used to watch my dad. And dad would come home from work every night, and my dad would get drunk. And every night I would watch my dad. And this is what my dad did. And he said, as I got a little bit older and I got involved doing things, he said, I wanted nothing more than my dad to just be proud of me. I just wanted to hear my dad say, good job, son. I just wanted to hear my dad say, I love you. I'm proud of you. And he said, I never, ever heard those words. Instead, what I saw come out of my dad's mouth was filth and anger. And he said, as we grew up, he said, instead of, of having a dad that he said as I was little that I, could, that I could look at and say, I want to be just like him. He's my hero. He said, I grew up thinking I have to protect my mom because my dad became violent towards my mom. And so I grew up in this home where even though my dad was present, he was invisible. And he said, I grew up and my, one of my brothers, he said, ended up um, completely running into sin and giving his life completely over to sin. He said, another one totally got messed up. And he said, but for some reason, he said, God got a hold of my heart and I gave my life to Christ. And I started going to church and I started saying, I want to break the cycle of what's been going on in my family. And he said, I became a pastor. And when he began to pastor, he said, one day I got a phone call that my mom was in the hospital. And he said, when I came into town to find out what had happened, my father was also in the hospital. 
And in a drunk or stupor, his father had smacked his mom and she fell and broke her neck against the coffee table. But he was so drunk that he ran out of the home in a rage and left his wife laying in the floor. When that happened, she was able to get a hold of a phone and call for an ambulance herself. The ambulance came and took her to the hospital. The next day, he found out what he had done by a coworker who found out that his wife was in the hospital. When that happened, he had a heart attack on the spot because of the stress of knowing what he had done. So both the mom and dad are now in the hospital when the son shows up who's a pastor. And he said, I went into my dad's room and I just thought, God, I don't even know how I'm going to walk in here and ever speak to him again. Yet I, I have Christ in my heart and my dad is lost. And so he said he walked into the room and he said as he walked in, his dad was kind of out of it. He was on some medication, obviously, for the pain. And he walked in and he said, he asked him how he was doing. And he said, all I said was, how are you doing? And as soon as I did, he just started talking. And he said he started crying and he started saying what a horrible man he was. Obviously, he didn't know this was his son. He thought it was one of the doctors. And as he began to spill everything about his life, he began to say what a horrible person he was and how he had landed in the hospital because he had hurt his wife and how he had these three boys and he started going off about the one who was a pastor. And he said, man, one of my sons is a pastor. And he said he pastors his big church. And he said that was a lie. My church wasn't big. But he said my dad was bragging about me and it was me. I'm standing there hearing for the first time in my life my dad is bragging about me. And he said, tears begin to run down my face. And he said, I love my sons so much. So proud of my son who's a pastor, who's doing the right thing. He made something of his life. He did something I never did. And then all of a sudden he said, dad. And his dad kind of blinked and realized he had been speaking all along to his son. And he began to bawl, and he began to cry, and he began to say, Son, please forgive me. And he said, These are words I never heard, but I longed for my whole entire life. He said, My dad was 70 years old that day. And he said, I looked at him, and I said, Dad, regardless of all the horrible things you've ever done in your life, Jesus gave his life so you could be forgiven. He said, Dad, can I pray with you? We accept Christ today. And he led his dad in the sinner's prayer. And at 70 years old, laying in the hospital, at the end of what he thought was his life, his son led him to the Lord. You know, the sad thing about that entire story is that there's many, many, many homes today. That's the story. Dad may be there, but it's an invisible dad. It's a dad who teaches what not to do rather than what to do. You see, God established in his word from the very beginning that men, that the dad is supposed to be that superhero that the children can look at and say, I want to be just like dad. You know, there's, there's two th things that, that happen in a man's life when, when, when something shifts in the mind of a father and he goes from being irresponsible to responsible. It's because two things have happened. Number one, it's become clear to them that the, re that the, the primary responsibility for the well-being of others, that's their children and their wife, rests on them and that others are relying on them. The second thing is that when, they've been, when, they, when they themselves have been trained from an early age by the men in their lives to recognize and assume that responsibility faithfully. That, that's, those are the two things that are really present in the mind of a man when they are fathering the right way. They feel like there's others that are dependent on them and, and they, it's almost like a torch has been passed or a baton has been passed onto them to say that this is how you do it son it's been it's been an experience that they have they have seen for themselves and they adopted it they took it for themselves and then they passed it on to their children and that's what god calls us to do as men i'm talking to you men right now god calls you to prepare the next generation and and the only way they're going to know what a godly man is and what a godly man looks like is when they see it through you you have a, a huge responsibility. You've got big shoes to fill, and that's the standard that Christ has set by the life that he lived so that you can show them how they are to live. So there's three keys here that I want to share with you guys for effective training when it comes to training your children uh, in, in a godly way. First of all, and that is what I was just saying, is that a father must set a godly example. We often view spiritual training as an event, and God expands it to include a lifestyle. Isn't that good? 
a lifestyle. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, and it says, and this is Paul speaking, he says, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Do you know that when, when your kids are grown, they are the people that they are because it's, it's all about what they have caught more than what they've been taught. Do you realize that? Think about it. Think about all of the things that you probably don't want to be, but you are because your parents were. Think about that. Think about the things that you picked up on from your parents, and you probably didn't even want to, but you did because it was drilled into you. And maybe not because they wanted to, it's just because of the type of person that they were. Maybe it's because they had not overcome the obstacles in their lives. And you adopted that as for your own lifestyle. And you took it on yourself and you became that thing that you did not want to become. God calls us to set the example, men. The second thing is that a father must train his kids to obey God's will. You've got to train your children to obey God's will. Think about it. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7 says this, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Impart the Word of God to your children. If Listen, men, if you don't think the Word of God is important, your children will not think the Word of God is important. And I don't know about you, but my worst nightmare is that any one of my children would miss heaven as their home and spend an eternity in hell. How many of you guys would like to have that weighing on your shoulders, to know that you missed the opportunity to impart the godly life that He's called us to, to your children, to teach them to obey His Word? It is your responsibility. Men, are you with me? Can you hear me this morning? I sure hope so. This is serious. The third thing is that a father reinforces the will to obey through affirmation, attention, and discipline. This is something we have got to stay on top of. There was a time when family values were reinforced by culture. There used to be a day and a time. My dad talks about... You know, my dad was born in, in the um, mid-early 40s, okay? And so when he went to school, he said, man, the biggest disciplinary issues at that time were chewing gum in class and having your shirt untucked. Chewing gum in class and having your shirt untucked. Now, we look at how our culture has just spiraled downward and how now I, I saw a news report just yesterday on social media about how they are beginning to uh, integrate um, this was in Virginia I, I'm trying to censor it because we have kids in the room but, but, but basically the sex education process beginning in kindergarten but not just for uh not just for heterosexuals, but for homosexuals. And they're training and teaching how this process works. And they're teaching how it happens. All different types of sex. From kindergarten, they're integrating this teaching all the way up. Now that's a little bit different than your shirt being untucked and chewing gum in class. We're talking about our, our culture and the authorities of our culture. The educational system is imparting immoral lifestyle to our children and what are we doing about it this is where we do not this is where we reject passivity and we don't just stand there and accept it listen you want me all right let's 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 really make that rubber hit the road okay i got a text last night my my boys are this is in the notes so we'll just forget that for a second um my boys are in a baseball tournament this weekend okay and uh it, it's a father's day tournament Somebody had the brilliant idea that it would be good to have baseball games going on during church. And, uh, and we told our, our team, you know, at the very beginning of the season, um, if, you, if you participate in any such, you know, events, you can count on us not being there. All right? And, and, and here's why. Because God comes first, not baseball. And we made it really clear at the beginning of the season. Well, I get a text last night. Hey, 
you know, we're, uh, we're up against a really tough team and, and it's going to happen tomorrow morning. You need to be there at 730. And I said, you can count on us not being there because God comes first. And I said, I'm not upset with you uh, as a coach. I'm upset with the fact that we as believers sit idly by in passivity and we don't say anything because what we do then we allow the culture to impact us rather than us impact the culture and we sit here idly by and by us participating we're saying hey you know what baseball is more important than worshiping in the house of God and I don't know about you but I will not tolerate it I won't and I won't participate in it that's how I am that's how I'm because it's worth fighting for God's house, our time with God, it's worth fighting for. We are here to impact the culture, not the culture impact us. And the only reason they schedule the games on Sunday mornings is because most people don't go to church. And so we're letting the people who don't go to church dictate when we're going to have tournaments when you could start it at 1 o'clock and play until the evening. It's an easy fix. Soapbox, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, it's a great example. How, how many of us, if all the believers in our communities would stand up and say, sorry, God comes first, not baseball. The Bible says we shall have no idols before us, and yet we want to make baseball an idol. The culture puts you into a predicament with your own children. Because when that text came through, our boys knew that our team has 10 players. Two being gone gives you eight. That means you're minus one on the field to play the game this morning. Brad and I looked at each other and we said, you know what, here's the thing. We set our standard before the predicaments ever come. We decide ahead of time what our values are and we don't back down. We looked at each other and we said, we have some explaining to do without offending to help them to understand why they're going to take it out every single ninth batter because our two boys are not going to be there. And we explained it the nicest way possible and they said, we completely understand. And we said, we'll be there as soon as you play that one. We'll be there for the afternoon game. We'll kick out of here, and we'll be headed to Venita to a tournament. And you know what? Our boys, then, for the next hour, we had to have a big family sit down. As they said, everybody's going to be mad at us. Everybody, our coach is going to make us run. Our team's going to be mad. Everybody's school is going to make fun of us because we put them into a bind. And we said, you know what? Here's the deal. It's a great opportunity for you to stand up for what's right. It's a great opportunity to say, God comes first in my life, in my parents' life, they taught us, we stand up for what's right. And you know what? That's a tough predicament, but I'm telling you guys, as we come into the end times, it's going to get tougher and tougher. And baseball is one thing, but what Brett's talking about with the education system is an entire nother. When we saw that, and you guys can read the article, it's sickening. It is sickening to know what's coming down the pike. And I looked at Brad and said, if that hits anywhere close to this town, I'll homeschool all four of mine. And if you know me, you know that that would be like, whoo, because like that ain't going to happen. But I said I would rip them out of the school system so fast. And if every believer did that, because here's the deal, our culture wants to dictate our values when God said it's up to the family, it's up to the head of that household to put their foot down and for dads to be that model that says, I'll set the standard in my home. And it takes a courageous leader to do it. And one thing that I had mentioned lovingly, not, it's not about being critical or judgmental. That's, that's not it because we want to love God and love people. So by the time it's all said and done, people need to understand that we love them, but we hate the way the system is. And I told them, Here, here's, here's the deal. Are my kids going to fall spiritually and just crumble and never serve God if they miss a church service? No, I know that. But, but here's what happens. If I, if I allow my kids to go instead of going to church, I'm telling my kids that it's okay to put baseball before God. Because this isn't about the tournament. It's not about the team. It's about me as a father grooming my boys for greatness. I have to show them what our values are and what is most important. And fathers, that is your job by example to show your children what is most important. You can't tell them, now, okay, now we know God comes first, right? Okay, just want to make sure you know. All right, so go ahead and load your baseball stuff up, and we're going to head out. But I just want you to know, God does come first. All right, okay, Dad, all right, ready to play. No, you have to show by example. You have to show by example. So God, uh, God has a, uh, a desire to, to empower each and every one of us fathers to make a supernatural difference in our natural environment. And that is by allowing God to indwell his presence inside of us and be Christ 
in every situation to our children. We have a tremendous responsibility to raise children that will one day affect their generation in an incredible way. And, and, and men, that is on your shoulders. Now, if you're, if you're a single mom, hey, guess what? God can still use, use you in an incredible way. And, and, and my prayer is that God would give you wisdom to surround your children with godly men. Because there may not be a biological father in, in this situation. There may not be even a stepdad in the situation that can impart that, that godly lifestyle and those values. But, but there are ways to go around it. There are ways to make sure that your kids are influenced and impacted in an amazing way so that they can be spiritual champions. Amen. Stand up with me today. I know this was a little bit different as far as the message is concerned, but I, I pray that... I pray that, that what was said has, has done something for you in your mind to, to inspire you, encourage you. Don't, don't settle for what's normal. Don't, don't be that invisible father. Don't, don't settle for just being average. Because there is nothing average about the God that is inside of you. There, there is nothing normal about living for God. Jesus ruffled every feather he came up against. Do you realize how many people hated him? But, but I want everybody to love me. It's not a popularity contest. It's about, at the end of the day, it's about doing what's right. And, and I'm sick and tired of spineless men that will not stand up and say and do and think what's right right it's your godly responsibility to man up you can do it you can do it you can do it i want to encourage you today i want to pray with you men today and and, and you families and i want to pray even for our, our children that we would that we would groom them for greatness you bow your heads with me today. Father, we in, in Jesus' name, God, we are so God, I'm just so my heart hurts for the culture that we live in. My heart hurts for the missing link in society. The authentic man of God. For that man that, that would reject passivity and accept responsibility and lead courageously and expect a greater reward. Who is that man, oh Lord? Who is that man that is willing to fight the good fight of faith, to be the leader of the home, to do what's right, say what's right, think what's right, Where is that man, oh God, to lead his home courageously, to lead by example, to impart biblical value into his children, to be that house band for the home, to be the provider and the protector and the pastor? Who is that man? I believe with all of my heart, Lord, that there are men in this place that can become that missing link. I believe we have leaders in this place, God, that you have empowered for greatness. I believe there are men in this place, Father God, who are sick and tired of being sick and tired of what's happening in our culture, in our schools, in our churches, in our homes, in our communities, Father God. I pray in Jesus' name that you would deposit within each and every man in this church a holy anger to stand up for what's right and to fight. Empower us with your strength and with the boldness that only comes from God. Enough is enough.
Today, if you are a man, you might be a man by, by nature. Physiologically, you might be a grown male, but that doesn't make you an authentic man of God. But we can be. And I pray right now, if you want to impart to your children, or maybe other children that you have influence with, you want to be that missing link. You want to be that, that father that stands up for what's right. That courageous leader. That authentic man of God, if, if you want that. And I know we prayed about this last week, but man, we cannot be reminded enough. I want to pray for you right now, if that's you. Will you agree with me right now? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your power and your presence and your boldness to come upon each and every man in this house this morning, Father God. Give them that holy anger in Jesus' name right now, God. Right now. Right now, Father God. Right now, Father God. Don't let these men, Lord, be a product of their environment. But let their environment be a product of them. God, I pray that they would see their children as precious and vulnerable and influenceable and that they would guard them, their minds, their heart. They would come around them, Father God, and protect them from this culture. that they would fight viciously to protect them. From the harmful influences that this culture offers. Let them have a burning sensation inside of them that will not die and cannot be put out to raise godly children chosen by God to make a difference in their world. Let them impart to them the Word of God, the fear of God, the obedience of God. Let us take this challenge, Father God, and run with it. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're in this place today and you would say, Pastor Brad, I, I sense God's presence in this house. And Pastor, I'm not, I'm not right. I'm not, I, I don't have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. But I want to make heaven my home. If that's you, I, I, want, I want to pray with you. And nobody's looking around. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I want to know who you are so I can pray with you. If that's you in this place, will you just raise your hand? Amen. I want you to pray with me right now. Just agree with me. Say, Father, I love you. Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Jesus. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. That you would forgive me of my sins. You would forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. That Jesus saves. That Jesus saves. I confess with my mouth that He is Lord and I need Him. And I dedicate my life from this moment forward to the living God and to His Word. To his word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you guys are believing God to pull this chain together, 
to mend this missing link with godly men. If you are believing that and you are going to continue to believe this for your culture, your community, and your country, and you're dedicated to praying that we would reverse the curse of a fatherless society, would you give God praise this morning if you're going to do that? At all, but you guys know that this church is a giving church, right? We give outside the walls of this church to make a difference, not just locally, but globally. This church, I'm telling you, is making a huge, huge impact on the nations. You wouldn't believe it. You don't judge a book by its cover. I'm telling you, we're making a difference. If you want to give by cash or check, you may do so as the buckets come your way after we pray. If you would prefer to just go the more convenient route, then I would text your giving today and that's very very easy you can just text the number 918-223-8090 and follow the instructions and you can give digitally